Good afternoon, and welcome to our third and last afternoon session of Inviting Biodiversity into Our Gardens and Beyond. Today, we'll be exploring native plant connections with naturalist Angela Morehouse and landscape designer Trevor Smith. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. The Land Conservancy is Ohio's largest land trust and to date has protected more than 70,000 acres of natural lands, family farms, and urban green spaces. At the Land Conservancy, I plan nature-based programming, both virtually and in person for people of all ages. Our goal is to provide a platform to learn and develop a greater appreciation of our natural world. I am pleased to continue our collaboration with the Cleveland Pollinator Native Plant Symposium and Nature Spark to bring you this series. My co-hosts, Anne Cicerella and Judy Semark, are passionate about the benefits of landscaping with native plants. Anne is the founder of the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium. She works to build connections and inspire conversations about the importance of restoring our fragmented native habitats, starting with our own backyards and community gardens. Judy possesses a wealth of knowledge about our natural world through her company, Nature Spark. She works with children and adults in the realm of nature education and exploration. Judy loves to share her nature knowledge through field trips and public programs, both virtually and in person. I thank them both for sponsoring and planning this symposium with me. We hope you'll stay engaged and join us over the coming weeks as we offer two more evening sessions. Both are available for registration on our website. The first one is scheduled for Tuesday, April 16th. Dr. Desiree Narango will join us for presentation for her presentation, Cultivating Backyard Habitat for Pollinators in Every Season. And on Tuesday, April 30th, we'll welcome Nancy Lawson, author of Wildscape, for her program, A World of Discovery, How Science and Heart Can Make You a More Ecological Gardener. Both these events will begin at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Links to registration are on the Land Conservancy's website. Now I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank our sponsors who have made it possible for us to offer this symposium for free. Thank you to the Ohio Division of Wildlife, Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, Avon League Gardens, Biodiversity and Landscape Design, the Cuyahoga Soil Water Conservation District, the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership, Leaves for Wildlife, Meadow City Nursery, Natives in Harmony, and Ohio Prairie Nursery. And remember, please use the Q&A feature to post your questions. We'll pause for questions if time permits following each presentation. Now on to our show. It's my pleasure to introduce Angela Morehouse. She is the author of Flower Bugs, a guide to flower associated true bugs of the Midwest. And today she'll be presenting Discovering Flower Bugs and their connection to native plants. Welcome Angela. You're muted. Oh, are you there? Oh, well, this is strange. She and I chatted before, um, about 10 minutes till one and everything was working great. I am at a loss here, everybody. I'm very sorry. I don't know where, where she went to. <laughs> I don't have a dog and pony show for everybody. Angela. Well, 
Well, while we wait, I can point out my beautiful um, cinnamon fern background that um, I changed it up. I figured we didn't need to see that snow anymore. So <laughs> I decided to go with something very spring-like for today. It is the beauty of technology, but I assure you that we um we chatted for a while um, before one o'clock on here. So I saw her and and spoke with her. So I'm really not sure what's going on now. Just so everyone knows, we are attempting to call and reach out. So we're not getting any response when we do that. It is true, Greg. April is um, Native Plant Month, which is great. It's coming up quickly. I know it's Ohio Native Plant Month, and there's also a push to um, have a National Native Plant Month each year. Well, until we figure out what is going on here, I'm going to go back to my loop about the upcoming stuff and um, try to figure out what's going on. Hang on, everyone. Okay, I'm here. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ah, oh, daylight savings time. Dang it. <laughs> you are you are on. You can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, that's what I was asking. I was gonna have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Later, I guess. Right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you see anything yet? I can throw, I think last time I threw it over here. Yeah, and then you just have to start the slideshow and you're okay. good to go. All right. So from beginning. Yes. All right, you see it? Oh, well, actually you you have it in your notes screen, whereas no. yesterday you didn't have it in your notes yeah, screen. I'm just trying to figure out what to do. Okay. With my... Uh, screen shift, so display settings. What if I swap? Is that working? That looks great, Angela. Okay, looks sorry. great. I get back to the beginning, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. There we go. Hey, thank sorry you. That. That's okay. <laughs> okay, we're ready to go. <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, daylight savings time. Not used to that yet. Okay, flower bugs, uh, the seldom seen connections between lesser known insects and native flowering plants. I'm real excited to be here today. I apologize for being late. Um, I wanna talk about uh, you know one of my favorite subjects. Um, I always feel like it's important to basically showcase the underdogs, the insects that don't get a lot of attention. Um, I love bees, I love butterflies. I've done a lot of research and continue to do on those taxa. But I don't hear a lot about you know, all the beetles and the flies and especially the true bugs that visit flowers. And there are a lot that do. Uh, and so in my process of taking photographs, um, it was decided that I should work on true bugs. And so I ended up publishing a book uh, called Flower Bugs. And I'd like to share a little bit of that with you today. Uh, so just for some context, uh, this is where I work in far uh, west central Illinois. Um, so I work for the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission as a field biologist. So I work out of a home office, it's about as far west as you can get in the state. So I'm across from where um, Iowa and Missouri meet. Uh, so that's my home office. Currently I cover all of the area in yellow. 
Um, I previously covered all the way to the Wisconsin border where we just hired two new staff. And so I'm in the process of, you know, collaborating and training and turning over some of my counties and some of my files uh, to the new staff that just started uh, this past fall. So my job duties, uh, this is just an example of a, one of the sand prairies that I work on. So I do land protection. We are essentially the land trust for the state of Illinois, for the Illinois DNR. Um, our jobs are to uh, create conservation easements. So permanent legal land protection uh, for high quality natural areas. So they can be owned by uh, the state, municipalities or, federal, or private landowners. Obviously the federal government um, cannot be overseen by us. We don't have authority over the federal government. So everything below that, state government and below, uh, we can actually do a conservation easement on. We are responsible for defending these areas from threats like uh, roads, utility lines, and even mismanagement by uh, landowners, which occasionally happens. Uh, we conduct management. Uh, this site has obviously been burned uh, fairly recently. Although not this year, we're still trying to get that burn in. Uh, but you can see all the trees in the background. We essentially are trying to bring this back to prairie, regardless of Savannah and the name, it should be prairie. And so we're trying to basically uh, control a lot of that brush, uh, get the flowers back and going. Flora and fauna inventories, um, I do probably more of that than my colleagues because that's my favorite part of the job. And I'm really good at taxonomy and I'm terrible at maps. Um, as part of that's a generational thing. I've been working on this job for 27 years. And I, my brain also just doesn't think, I love maps, I love using them, I can't create them. I can just go onto Google Earth and do my little drawings. So I got uh, into um, insects about, um, let's see, uh, 2012, 2013. Uh, I had been doing plants before, I was a plant ecologist and I got a little bit frustrated. I've been doing butterfly surveys, but with the whole um, rise in interest of pollinators and of course the rusty patch bumblebee, um, I wondered what we were doing uh, as a state organization uh, with Department of Natural Resources, what were we doing for pollinators? And the answer was pretty much nothing. They would come to me and ask me, okay, Angela, uh, what do we do here? And so I decided to start collecting data because data is always good. You always hear, we don't have enough data. We don't have enough data. Well, let's go out and get data. So I created on my own without any funding, just, just part of my uh, side projects, part of my job. I created a... Um, photographic pollinator survey. So I like taking pictures. I don't like collecting things. I'm by myself. I don't have, you know, a big staff to help me go into the lab and look under the microscope and pin all these and identify them. I take photographs. I put them on iNaturalist or Bug Guide and I get help that way. It's a tremendous resource. I suggest everybody do that. Please start documenting because there's not enough of us out there doing this. So the more people that can take pictures, the better. So I visit six protected natural areas, the ones in our protected programs each year, four visits a year, different times, different seasons, so I can get more insects visiting different flowers. I record all of the insects and the flowers they are visiting. So I record all the ones that are flower visitors or um, have pollen on them or I've seen them previously on flowers. So I'm trying to document as much diversity as possible. Thereby, I don't stick to a straight line and only count 10 feet on each side. I wander. I do meandering transects, in which I wander from patch, flower patch to flower patch, because I want to get the most diversity I possibly can. For me, I limit my time, so I do it by time. So how many insects am I seeing per hour? So I try to spend 60 minutes per site, sometimes uh, using the trails, the path of least resistance. It takes a little longer. And so I've gone up to uh, 90 minutes for some sites, but I can still uh, basically whittle that down to uh, how many I'm seeing per hour. And I try to photograph everything I can. What do I do with all this data? Because I have a lot of data. I've done these surveys now for six years, 30 different sites. What do I do with all of it? A lot of photographs. So several years ago, COVID hit and I'd been wanting to do a wasp guide. So I thought this is the perfect chance. I couldn't do anything. The, the state would not let us even go outside our offices and visit any of our sites. So I started working on wasps. So I worked with the Field Museum and used my photographs to create these rapid field guides. So basically I provide them with the photographs and the information for the different species. And then they help me generate this layout. So I did wasp and I did, this is the common bee genera. I did flies of Illinois. And then I decided to make a moth guide because I didn't know how to identify moths and there's no good field guide out there. I love the, uh, 
uh, uh, gosh, the guide out there for gardening um, that's from Ohio there. I love that guide, but that wasn't available at the time. And so I wanted the moss from Illinois that I see on my sheets. Uh, some of these were taken outside of Illinois as well. I split that into five sections. All of these are available as free downloads. So if anybody is looking um, to uh, you know print out my guides, I basically get, make color printouts and I laminate them and I take them out in the field with me if I'm doing a BioBlitz event where I don't have access to the internet. Uh, rather than looking on my phone, I can look at these sheets and I can pass these sheets around and they're side-by-side -side comparisons. Right now I'm trying to work on flies of the Midwest and I'm getting too busy. Uh, so maybe I'll get to that. <laughs> Flower Bugs is a book that I just published uh, with Heather Holm from Pollinator Press. Uh, this past November it came out. And this was a chance for me to create a field guide uh, to help people like myself who are going out there photographing, looking out in the wild, looking at these native plants and seeing you know, different types of insects, bugs, visiting these flowers. So I wanted to bring awareness to the fact that true bugs, heteroptera, are visiting our native flowers. It's not just the bees and the flies and the butterflies and the beetles, bugs are out there too. I want to encourage others to plant native and to monitor, to actually document, hopefully with a photograph, what's out there. And I've obviously my goal as a part of my job, protect and preserve native biodiversity. So why focus on bugs? Uh, bugs do not represent the majority by any means. Bees by far uh, are the most uh, common by abundance. So individuals are always, there are always more bees, but look at the tax richness. Now, in the case of bees, I can't always identify them to species. And there's a group of sweat bee, Lasioglossum dialectus, the metallic sweat bees, where there might be 40 different species within that subgenus, but I can't identify them to species. So that's a little bit uh, mis of a misrepresentation, but still flies and beetles represent um, a really wide diversity of species, uh, even resembling close to the bees. Um, so there's a lot out there, but true bugs actually represent 8%, 8 to 7% of the taxa richness, so the number of species and about 5% or more of the amount of individuals that I'm seeing on the flowers. So true bugs. So my book um, deals with bugs from the order Hemiptera, but suborder Heteroptera. So I didn't include like plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, cicadas, um, aphids, things like that. I only focused on the Heteroptera because these are the bigger ones and these are the ones more likely to be visiting the flowers. I focused in on the ones that actually do visit flowers and feed on pollen and nectar, but I also included all the other photographs that I could fit in uh, just to give uh, people an idea of what these bugs look like. Some of them look similar, the non-flowering visiting ones look similar to some that do visit flowers. And I just wanted to get that out there so people had a reference. So it's meant to be used out in the field. If you find something, hopefully you can uh, use my book to help identify it. Uh, flower bugs covers 23 families of heteroptera found from out throughout the Midwest. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten over to Ohio yet, but I did spend some time in Michigan. I spent time in Wisconsin, but mostly it's been Illinois and across the river in Ohio and Missouri, a little bit in Minnesota. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through a few of these. So there's a lot of them that are kind of similar looking, especially the brown stink bugs. This gave me the most problems when I first started out. I needed to learn how to distinguish quickly the three different types of brown stink bugs. So the spine soldier bug on the left is predatory. So it's the one that's actually feeding on caterpillars and sucking the juice out of them. So if you see a brown looking stink bug feeding on a caterpillar, mm -hmm. it's a spine soldier bug. Mm -hmm. These are characteristic of, if it has it, there's usually a dark um, spot on the lower membrane of the wing of the wingtips. That's not always present because when they get, obviously when they get older, it gets tattered and torn. You can't always see that. The brown marmara stink bug is famous for getting to our houses. I currently have, let's see, not today, but <laughs> I usually have one here in my office uh, that sneaks in. They have this light patch on the antenna at all ages. So even when there are nymphs, you can see that light patch on the antenna. None of the other brown stink bugs have that. So if you see the white patches on the antennae, that's a brown marmorine stink bug. The common brown stink bug by default is the other one. So this is a native one. There are several different species. Uh, lots of times you can see this dark blotch in the center of the scutellum, which is that triangular patch in the middle of the back. Um, they have, can have speckles on their legs. You typically try to get a belly shot, a ventral shot, because it's the uh, coloration and shape of the spiracles on the underside that can actually get to a species ID for this one. 
So I, lots of times I'm basically bending down, getting on the ground, trying to get an underside belly shot. Sometimes I actually just pick them up and hold them to take the photograph. So I hold them on my left hand, take the photograph with my right hand, just so I can actually see uh, the ventrum. Milkweed seed bugs, we've all seen these. So the easy way to identify these is the small milkweed bug, which is out there in my willow right now, has one big heart over the thorax. Um, so in the center there is one big heart. The false milkweed bug, which actually visits Heliopsis, so false oxide sun sunflower, has two hearts stacked up against each other. So there's two hearts on the back instead of one. Often the small milkweed bug has an outline in the back, the black of the wings is outlined in white. The large milkweed bugs are larger, but they have this big black band across the center of their back. They can be a little redder than that as they get uh, more mature, they start out a little bit orange. Uh, but those three characteristics are the best and the fastest way to rapidly identify those. Uh, there's these little tiny uh, black bugs that look like seeds, so you have to look really close, uh, but they're in two totally different families. So the white margin burrow bug is actually, um, it's actually called the uh, parent bug too, because it has basically takes care of its babies. It's one of the few shield bugs do it too, that actually uh, watch over their babies for a few days. So these are outlined in white from the edge of the head all the way around the abdomen to the other side of the head, all the way in white. It's the only one that has that. The ebony bug has a whitish to kind of a translucent uh, outline around the abdomen. Also the scutellum of the borer bug, there is a triangular scutellum on the back, whereas in the ebony bug, the scutellum is expanded to basically cover the whole abdomen. Now a beetle would have two parts uh, to the wings that would unfurl. This one is basically has to lift up and then the wings fall under it. So that scutellum is basically covering the entire abdomen. Green stink bugs. Right now, the common green stink bug, which is what I call it, is all over the woods. It's very, very common. Uh, you can kind of tell some of a little yellowish tinge to it, kind of a yellow spotting. And on the edge of the outline of the abdomen there, it's kind of like black, yellow, and green, kind of sometimes a little bit of white. Uh, but these are so common, that's kind of like seeing a robin. You just get so used to them, you know what that one looks like. So when you see the other two, you know it's not the common one. So the pink board green stink bug doesn't always have these bright pink borders. Sometimes it's kind of a pale yellow, but it does have a distinct border around it. I only find these on milkweeds around here, and I don't find them very often. The red shoulder stink bug does not always have the red shoulder. Uh, this one kind of has a faint tinge of pinkish. Um, on the shoulder, across the thorax there. Sometimes they come in brown, uh, pale green, or they can have a bright magenta shoulder. Where to find bugs? So this is the thing I really like to focus on. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about the different plants that you go to. Um, a lot of people, I you know, come from a plant background, so I wanna know when I'm looking at a plant, what types of uh, bugs can I find on that plant? And so that's where I'm going with this. So some bugs are household pests. I always me already mentioned the brown marmorate stink bugs. When I was little, my grandma's old house, she had, she had an old brick house. That she got box elder bugs every winter. Um, I still hear some people getting box elder bugs. I, I have a log house. I get the stink bugs. I don't get the box elder bugs. Garden pests. I get a lot of uh, criticism for my love of bugs because obviously squash bugs will feed on squash. Um, and some of these uh, will feed on ornamental plants um, and crops. Um, but I plant for native diversity. So I don't care if they're chewing on my plants. That means the plants are serving a purpose. The plants have attracted them to my yard and it's okay. Now, occasionally the tussock caterpillars will start feeding on my butterfly milkweed. If that's the case, they need to either transfer to another milkweed or they're gonna get it. Um, but for the most part, I try really hard um, to appreciate them and just to deal with the damage. Some are used for natural biocontrols. I'm not a big fan of using, especially non-native insects for biocontrols because I think we're messing the system up. But I am kind of happy that they're starting to recognize and appreciate some of the predatory native bugs for their services for killing pests. The minute pirate bug is thought to be introduced. You can actually buy vials of them to introduce to go after thrips. So in your ornamental plantings, you can buy minute pirate bugs. So far, they have not expanded to the point that they have become a pest in our native ecosystems. 
That could change. I don't know. Right now, if you look on iNaturalist, there are more minute pirate bugs in the new world than they are in the old world, which is where they're from. So you don't see a lot of them being photographed in Europe, which is really strange. But they say they are not native to North America. Okay, talking about the relationship between true bugs and native plants. So that's really what my book focuses a lot on. So which flowers are these bugs found on? Okay, they are very abundant. I love this photograph. These are a little bitty uh, uh, helmeted squash bugs that had, bugs that had just um, hatched from their eggs. And so the great thing about these is if, if you look closely on the antennae, there is a flattened spot on the third antennal segment. Only helmeted squash bug nymphs have this. Uh, so it's really cool. Many bugs feed on flower, pollen, and nectar. Um, so this is one thing I had never heard of. Originally, I was always taught that it's bees are the ones that feed on pollen and nobody else, none of the other insects feed on pollen. Well, that's obviously not true. I have documented all sorts of different types of insects feeding on pollen. Um, the first one on the left there is an assassin bug. It is supposed to be killing other bugs and eating them. Clearly that one is feeding on nectar guy's head down there. I've seen this repeatedly. I've seen this species feeding on nectar. Um, the other two on the bottom are both different types of plant bugs. Plant bugs are known for piercing uh, the stems and the leaves and basically sucking all the juices out of the plants. Um, these are clearly feeding on, um, in the case in the middle there, that's feeding on pollen. There's no doubt that that noroculpus, which has really fuzzy, the first antennal segments are really fuzzy. That's how you identify that one. And then again, the ebony bug uh, is just completely coated with pollen. Um, they, do, they are feeding on that. Many bugs lay their eggs in flower seeds and heads. So the young adults are feeding on the seeds, but they never seem to do a lot of damage. So I've never found an instance where native bugs have actually had a big impact on seed production because we're collecting, of course, we're collecting uh, the prairie seeds so we can basically redistribute somewhere else and get more prairie. Um, and I do a lot of seed collecting. And unfortunately, the more I learn about bugs and the more I learn to recognize bugs, the harder it is for me to collect seed because the bugs are all over. So I put them through a little tiny screen there uh, on the bottom um, right there, and the bugs still came through the screen. So that's a window screen. It's really, really fine. And the bugs, the little nymphs and stuff are still getting through that screen. So I don't really know how to separate the bugs from the seed. Um, I'm trying to leave the bowls out so they can get free. Yes, I can transport the bugs to other sites if we're seeding right away. Obviously, if you're processing the seed and keeping it in you know, storage bags, the bugs are gonna die. And I don't want my bugs to die because this is my backyard and I care about my bugs. Uh, some bugs are predatory. And so some of them are feeding on pests. I'm really excited when I found this, um, uh, that's not a wheel bug. Sorry, that is, a, um, that is a bee assassin feeding on a Japanese beetle. I'll need to fix that. Um, but also the uh, jagged ambush bug feeding on a, a spotted cucumber beetle. A lot of people don't like that species. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the honeybee. It's non-native and competing with our other bees. So I was pretty excited to find this. Uh, actually, the milkweed is the one that has killed this honeybee. So basically it got stuck on the pollinia and it died there on the plant. And the small milkweed bug came along and decided it wanted to try something different. So it's sucking uh, the juices out of the honeybee. So plant associations. So these uh, plants that are listed here, and I'm gonna go over each one of these, are the ones that seem to attract specialist bugs. So if you're looking for this particular bug, it really helps to go to this plant species. And with luck, you'll find them. In fact, my prairie now is 15 years old. I only have about an acre and a half in prairie, but I have attracted a lot of these species um, to my yard just by having the right plants. So milkweeds. I kind of wanted to show off this one because this one is not supposed to be a milkweed specialist, but here in Illinois, they seem to have um, become adapted to feeding on milkweeds. This is what they call the four o'clock bug. This is a leaf footed bug that has come west from the west on railroads, they think, with the plant Mirabilis, so four o'clock, wild four o'clocks. A lot of the sites where I fi uh, find it do not have wild four o'clock, but they have milkweeds and they have Indian hemp. And this is found on those species. Uh, instead of the four o'clock. So mountain mints, my favorite, absolute favorite. People ask me what to plant, plant mountain mint and plant golden alexanders. Those are my two favorite plants to attract bugs and a diversity of pollinators. So this uh, particular seed bug is a seed bug. It's supposed to be feeding on the ground and the seeds fall to the ground. Most seed bugs actually feed on the ground. This one feeds a lot. You'll see this on other species, 
but it really, really likes mountain mint. And you'll see the, um, the nymphs and the adults feeding together and you'll feed it throughout the season. I actually saw these on December 23rd this year because um, it hadn't quite gotten cold enough for them. And they basically were laying their eggs and their nymphs were in the seed heads. Um, so from July through December, whenever these are on the mountain mint seed heads. So tick tree fools. For some reason, this leaf hood bug, the nymphs of it, physogaster, they are dorsoventrally flattened. Uh, so flattened like a pancake and they're bright green. So they're kind of hard to see in the foliage, but they're really funky looking bugs. The nymphs love all the tick trifles and that's where I see them. They blend in so well. Um, a lot of different bugs like legumes. So uh, this is just a picture of a rod headed bug. They come in brown and, and green, or sorry, brown and black colorations. Um, and they are found on a lot of different legumes. Unfortunately, one of my problems is we have Cerecia lesbidiza that we try to control. And so we're out there spraying that uh, with chemicals because we just can't get under control and fire actually causes it to spread. Um, so we don't want that competing with our native legumes. So we're out spraying for Cerecia lesbidiza. And unfortunately, these bugs are all over Cerecia lesbidiza as well as the natives. And I always worry that I'm spraying these and I try really hard uh, not to spray these bugs. Um, this happened out in my yard. Um, there's not a lot of these posted um, on iNaturalist or a bug guide uh, for the Midwest, but these are Baptisia lace bugs. Essentially, I saw this gray looking like fuzz, the dust on, on the undersides of my white wild indigo leaves. And I kind of looked at that and my eyesight's getting worse. So I took pictures of them, blew it up. And it's like, oh my gosh, they're lace bugs. And so of course I went back out there and took a lot more pictures of these, but they are exclusive to the Baptisia plants. Partridge pea also attracts a lot. Um, now partridge pea does not produce nectar in the flowers. It's only producing pollen. So this bug, this is a native rapid plant bug. It's related to the um, alfalfa plant bug. They're the same genus. Um, that one's non-native, this one's native. And this one clearly is feeding on the pollen because there's no uh, nectar. The nectar on partridge pea, of course, is a nectar-like substance that's found in the glands on the stems. And there are bugs and ants and wasps that will feed on that. Um, so the twice-stab stink bug is probably the stink bug that uses flowers more than any. I mean, these exclusively use flowers, but they'll use usually purplish pink uh, flowers belonging to the Scrofulariaceae or the mint family. So figworts, hedge nettle, turtle head, um, obedient plant, germander, this happens to be germander. Um, they really like those little tube-like flowers. And a lot of times they'll get inside them, especially the obedient plant. And you'll see them uh, basically mating and you know doing all their thing. You'll see the nymphs on these plants as well. This was an exciting one for me because I had never seen this in the wild until I saw it on my prairie. I have a lot of rattlesnake master. It seems to like my clay soils. And this is a beautiful stink bug. They had previously been known from uh, Queen Anne's Lace, which of course is not native. So I'm curious, why would a native bug be exclusive to Queen Anne's Lace? Then I started finding them on Rattlesnake Master. Like the mint, mountain mint bugs, these do not leave Rattlesnake Master. So as soon as Rattlesnake Master starts to bloom, you see these uh, bugs, you see the nymphs with the adults. Throughout the seed collection season, they're still on the Rattlesnake Master. I'm sure they're laying their eggs inside the dense seed heads. Um, and basically rearing their young on rattlesnake master. So that's a really cool plant to have as well. Uh, goldenrods, of course, there are a lot of goldenrods out there. This one happens to be showy goldenrod. Um, this particular assassin bug, and this is a relative of the pale green assassin bug, which we see a lot in the woods. That one doesn't visit flowers near as much. This one loves flowers. For whatever reason, this one, this zealous, uh, likes goldenrods, and you'll find him very frequently, and I'll find him coated with pollen. And again, this is the uh, insidious pirate bug. Lots of times I'll see these on the little tiny asters or daisy flea banes, things like that, but very common. A lot of times these are so small, these are a couple millimeters um, in length. And a lot of times it's an incidental. Um, so I'm photographing another bug and I'll say, oh, by the way, I'd also photograph this one. So I don't always actually see these bugs as I'm photographing them, uh, but once in a while I do. Daisy flea bane is perhaps the number mm -hmm. one flower, which we don't plant, it just pops up as a weed, but it attracts more true bugs than any other plant out there for whatever reason. It's so beautiful because these little tiny flowers um, just provide a really photogenic backdrop uh, for photographing uh, bugs. 
And so this scentless plant bug, which is kind of pinkish green in color, um, really well known for daisy flea beans. It'll also go to asters and a few other, but it likes daisy flea bean. Prickly pear cactus. This one, the cactus quarry bug is exclusive to cactus. I don't know how far north they have. I think in central Illinois is the furthest we've ever seen these. They're in Missouri, the southern half of Missouri as well. So it's kind of on the edge of the range for the Midwest. Um, but wherever we have prickly pear cactus um, in southern Illinois and Missouri, you can find these bugs. And a lot of times they, they spend their whole life on cactus. So they'll feed on the pads, the little babies are on the pads. You'll see the adults and the babies together, um, but they will not be found away from that plant. Um, it's very similar with the euphorbia bugs. They like um, spurges. So flowering spurge is our most common one out in the prairie, um, but they'll use, uh, uh, was it? Uh, there's other types of milk spurge and things like that they'll be found on, but flowering spurge is the more showy one. That's the one we would plant in our gardens. Milkworts. So I never see the adults on these, but I have seen uh, the immature. There's a little nymph on milkworts. So this is just a common field milkwort. Um, pink milkwort is state endangered in Illinois. And there's, I've seen some papers on basically studying this to find out if this uh, leaf footed bug is truly predatory, is actually causing harm to state endangered plant. And they're basically have found out, no, that all the damage, if any, is all cosmetic. Um, that they're just raising their young on milkworts, which is a kind of a small little plant. Uh, I typically find the adults on goldenrod. I found them on Indian hemp, but they're fuzzy. They got really dense velvet-like hairs that are just kind of crisscrossed across their back and they've got a lumpy shape to them. And they're just a really fascinating bug to find. Oxide false sunflower. Again, this is similar to the small milkweed bug, but it has two hearts over the back. And so this is the false milkweed bug. You'll occasionally see them on milkweeds as well. They visit a lot of different types of flower, but they are pretty exclusive to rearing their young on oxide false sunflower. So Heliopsis helianthoides is what they need. And so if I see somebody takes a picture of this plant, I say most likely you have Heliopsis in your prairie. You have oxide false sunflower within your prairie plantings. They're very common in plantings because that's one species that we include a lot in our seed mixes. Biennial gar is one we don't usually plant, but it kind of pops up here and there on its own. But if you basically visit uh, biennial gar when it starts flowering in late into the um, summer and fall, you will see it covered in these stilt bugs. And you'll see the babies on there and you'll see the adult just masses. They like these glandular plants. So uh, common even primrose is another one in that same family. I think now they're both anitherous. Uh, so they've changed the genus on this plant. Um, but these bugs really, really like this. So it's kind of cool to find, you know, if you have gara, you've got to have this bug. Um, common ragweed, of course, is one that I would encourage anybody to plant but appreciate it if you got it and we don't have to kill them all. But look for this bug because it's really pretty. It's really, really tiny. I occasionally get these when I nightlight as well. So it'll come to a sheet at night, but they're just beautifully colored. That, that um, yellow and brown uh, contrasting back and then the green thorax and the cool light colored eyes. Um, this is the ornate plant bug and it really does like uh, common ragweed. Giant ragweed also attracts a bunch of bunch of different types of bugs. Uh, trans tracks those uh, candy stripe leaf hoppers will go to giant ragweed. Um, there's a lot of wasps that actually will lay their eggs in giant ragweed. They're natives, I used to hate them. Now I like ragweed because I because of all the diversity it brings me. So I don't, well, I pull the giant ragweed from my better prairie areas. I leave it in the, the back edges uh, just so I can go find bugs. Spiderwort. Now I've not seen this one feeding on the flowers, but it always is found in the flower clusters. So I'm not quite sure if this is just sucking on the juices, it may be. Um, but this is a type of plant bug. It also comes in a black variation. Sometimes it's all black with a kind of a reddish orange thorax. So it has a lot of different color variations in it, but they do like the clusters, the flower clusters of spider warts. And they also like uh, the carrion flowers. So bunchberry, carrion flower, they'll be in the same, very, very similar types of flowers with that little cluster and they will be found in there. Orange jewelweed. Now you rarely see that common green stink bug on flowers. Um, I've seen a few of them of the adults on flowers, but the nymphs, they just look at them. They look like they were made, that they evolved alongside orange jewelweed because they just match the coloration so well of the uh, orange jewelweed plants. And so I often find the nymphs 
with uh, orange jewelweed or spotted touch me not, what you want to call it, in patients. So late bone set, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a real good photograph of this, but this particular scentless plant bug, um, this is a relative of that pink and green one they found on daisy fleabane. Uh, this brown uh, species likes bone set. So you find it in the late summer on bone set on hill parades and prairie plantings, you will find uh, this scentless plant bug. Elderberry bugs. So these are found exclusively on elderberry. So this was the one that has the hairy antennae. So the first segment of the antennae is extremely hairy, um, but the elderberry one has this dark uh, blotching, this dark, almost uh, black, dark brown uh, coloration on the legs and on the back, um, but they are found only on elderberry. Other bugs, that bug attracting flowers. So obviously those are some nice flowers, but there's many other flowers that we put in our prairies that will attract not necessarily the specialist bugs, but it'll attract a wide variety of bugs. So these lupine bugs are so named because they do usually like legumes, but they also like mountain mint. Everybody likes mountain mint. Um, so I'm just kind of showing off. So I'll talk about some of these other flowers that you can plant. So again, that spine, spine soldier bug that everybody hates because they will suck the juices out of caterpillars. And occasionally those caterpillars are monarch caterpillars. Um, but they are native and they are doing those thing, their thing. I, I always feel like maybe that monarch that gets, that gets eaten by these wasn't very healthy to begin with. So it kind of weeds out and makes the population of monarchs healthier. So there is a role for predators. They do take the weak. Just like when I go out and collect some of these things, I'm not very good at netting. I don't like to kill things. I really have a hard time. So I will take a little vial out. And I will try to capture my insects in the vial, which is fairly easy for a bug, but it's really hard for bees. A lot of times the bees get away. And I figure the healthiest bees are going to get away from me because I'm not very good at it. So if I'm catching some of the bees, I feel like, well, that was the slow one anyway. So give them a little chance there. That's on Indian hemp and dog beans. So purple cone flowers, uh, this is the bee assassin that was it, feeding on the Japanese uh, beetle there. Um, they seem to like uh, cone flowers. They like lead plant. They like a lot of different ones but bright like pink and purple flowers. Dogwoods will also be on, which of course is a white flower, um, but in the middle of the summer, so June, July, you really see uh, the bee assassins. Um, very cute little things. Um, this is a ringed assassin bug. Um, there's also a yellow assassin bug that's, very, that's closely related. This one kind of has white and black uh, banding on the legs, whereas the yellow assassin bug has yellow and black banded legs. Um, I've seen both of them on the same sites. Um, and they do like uh, black-eyed Susans, brown-eyed Susans, sweet black-eyed Susans, all of the Rudbeckias. Um, golden Alexanders, that's my second favorite plant. I have to have Golden Alexanders for the diversity of all pollinators that it tracks. Plus it's the first thing to bloom in the spring. I can't seem to get pussy toes uh, in my yards, um, but Golden Alexanders, I have planted a ton of it. I probably have thousands. I always tell everybody, you can't possibly have enough Golden Alexanders. I'm probably getting close to that stage. I, I have a lot. I probably produce uh, 10, 20 pounds of seed every year if, if I wanted to collect it all. And so this is the native brown stink bug, uh, the one that you want to photograph its belly. Um, so there it is. You can kind of see that dark patch in the center of that triangular scutellum. So here again is the white margin burrow bug. They do love pussy toes. Several little tiny, <clears throat> excuse me, bugs like pussy toes. Um, so they'll be out there feeding on those. Um, wild quinine. I never used to think that wild quinine was very attractive because it seems to have, you know, kind of a little flower. You don't see a lot of pollen coming off of it. It is very attractive to a lot of pollinators. And so I do see helmeted squash bugs. I see nymph wheel bugs out there uh, visiting um, wild quinine. So it's just a really good one to have. If you want diversity, you want diverse native plants. So there's just, it's very simple. Find out what native plants that belong in your area and your soil type, uh, your moisture type and plant those. And you will get planted and they will come. Like I said, my prairie is 15 years old now, uh, but I, it's been really interesting to notice the progression of diversity. I'm getting, I still am getting more insects. I've probably photographed, um, and this is a terrestrial invertebrates, so it includes spiders and centipedes, but I have about 2000 different invertebrates photographed from my prairie over the past, uh, mostly uh, past eight years, and I'm still finding more. So it's pretty good for an acre and a half. So here's the clouded plant bug. So again, this is the one with the hairy antennae. 
Uh, so bee balms, and this, this is the spotted bee balm that grows in the sand prairies. Wild bergamot are really attractive for every pollinator. Uh, lots of different guilds of pollinators will visit um, those. Mm -hmm. They're hard to photograph because of the petals. Coreopsis, I used, didn't used to think Coreopsis uh, were very attractive. There's not a, a tremendous amount of bugs that visit them, but again, it's diversity. The more different floral types you provide, the more insects you're gonna get. So this is a dirt colored seed bug, which again is supposed to be in the dirt. Um, a lot of these you do not find up in the vegetation. They're on the ground, you know, underneath logs and stuff, feeding on seeds. This one in particular does seem to like uh, Coreopsis and some of the other flowers. So you'll see that uh, mid-level in the vegetation feed in the flowers. Again, this is the brown stink bug, the native one. This is a belly shot, so it kind of gives you a view of how I was able to um, get down low and, and basically tilt so I could actually see which one this is. I think this is Eustitius cervus, um, but he's obviously feeding on the pollen because you can see the pollen all over his face and his antennae. Um, ironweed is one of my favorites. I mean, that beautiful fuchsia color, that, that purple pink. Um, I got a really rare uh, bee this year in my backyard um, on ironweed, so I'm pretty excited. But jagged ambush bugs, um, Sam Drogi calls them flower dragons. I love these guys. They can actually, they're always doing this. They're always mating, making more, uh, but they can actually both feed on, you know, a prey at the same time that they're mating. So I've only seen them with one of the individuals feeding on a eastern tail blue butterfly at the time while the other one was on its back. So the female was feeding, but apparently there are photographs out there of the males also with their own prey uh, doing their thing, uh, making more jagged ambush bugs. So, and with that, I just kind of want to close and say, I want to encourage you to take the time to notice the bugs because they really, they're out there and they play an important role um, in pollination, in just the ecology of our native plants. They're out there doing their thing and they deserve to be considered as, uh, as pollinators and flower visitors and go out there and take pictures of them. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I would say that hands down, everyone's in love with your photography. So <laughs> it's really great fun to see these um, bugs up close like this. So I, I appreciate it. And we do have questions, as okay. you can imagine. Um, so earlier in your talk, you mentioned the tussock moths, mm -hmm. um, and someone had found a bunch of them on her milkweed last year. So do they harm the plant? Like, um, just a little bit more about the tussock moth. Well, I'm not an expert on moths, okay. but I have seen them kill my common milkweeds. Uh, which oh, okay. makes me nervous uh, for it. Now they probably don't kill the plant completely, but they uh, completely defoliate it to the point that the above ground portion dies. So I'm guessing okay. the roots are probably still alive, but when it comes to butterfly milkweed, I want the seed off of that. And so I'm not gonna tolerate them destroying my seed production. And so I, a lot of times if it's a small infestation, I will try to move them over to a common milkweed, which I have a ton of just popping up as weeds along the edge of the prairie. And I will put them in the common milkweed, which I can okay. lose some of that and I don't care. But I don't want to lose butterfly milkweed. Purple milkweed is another one. I have that in my yard. You know, there's certain special plants that, you know, you do what you can to make sure you don't lose them. And you okay. will lose the above ground. If not, the whole plant could die if you okay. have, I mean, hundreds, thousand uh, tussock caterpillars feeding on them. So Okay. <laughs> um, how can one attract more wheel bugs to their garden? Well, wheel bugs don't typically um, feed on flowers too often. Now the babies will, the, the uh, nymphs will, but basically it's a matter of food. So they're mostly predatory. Um, so they're looking for food. I did not used to have wheel bugs. The first 10 years of my prairie, I don't know if I ever saw a wheel bug. Then they wow. exploded. Uh, wow. This last year was a big year for wheel bugs. Everybody was posting them on Facebook. What is this? What is this? I was like, by then you would think you would have figured it out. Because uh, they do have that very distinctive uh, you know, wheel, the cog on their back. Um, and yeah, this is just a couple of nymphs. I thought these two, it's probably siblings here. I thought uh, these two were just so cute. Um, mm -hmm. they, they just look so harmless, but they are very painful if you get, if you get bit by these. Um, okay. And so I get a little bit freaked out once. And I love to photograph them from a few inches. Um, but I had yeah. one of them, I was basically moving the plant around and it jumped on me and I freaked <gasps> out for a minute. I screamed and jumped and, <laughs> and my brother-in-law was right there to see me. And I, I felt so embarrassed. I was like, no, no, I'm not afraid of them. I just don't want to get hurt. <laughs> so basically having more native plants 
you're attracting their prey. So okay. you basically go feeding on other other insects. So the more natives you have, you're going to get real bugs. It just may take some time. Makes sense. Um, here's someone that's interested to know why the plants that are known as keystone species are host to so many insects. Is it due to their flowering and fruiting time, the quality of their leaves or bark, the accessibility or nutritional value of their nectar, or question mark? Well, if they're two pollinators, uh, that last one, the quality of the pollen, especially because pollen has protein. Okay. Um, so, and there's a lot of insects that require that protein. I'm, I'm the species lead for the Regal Fridlary. And they found out that the Regal Fridlary females, as they're feeding in the fall, just before they lay their eggs, it's the amount of high quality protein that they feed on affects larval survival. Okay. So I, I think this is my guess that it's field thistle in the case of real fritillary. That's a big one that produces a lot of pollen. So I really think um, that it's the quality of the pollen. Now there's other things obviously that they're attracted to. Um, interestingly, sunflowers, especially those of the carrot family, like your wild parsnip, but there's a bunch of natives, golden oxander, again, plant golden oxander, have promiscuous flowers. It means they're very, you don't have a specialized, have to have a specialized mouth part to fit in there. You don't have to be a long tongued bee to actually get down in there and feed on that nectar. Um, it's a flat surface that any bug flies can easily feed on with a little, you know, suction cup mouth, like sucker mouth. Um, so those wild parsnip attracts a tremendous amount, unfortunately, because I don't like wild parsnip. Um, so that's why I encourage people to plant golden alexander, meadow parsnip and some other things. Uh, because it has those promiscuous flowers that attract so many. So in that case, yes, it, it is maybe not the quality, but the accessibility of the flower that attracts a lot of bugs. But again, some bugs will only go to one particular plant and it might be milkwort. It might not even be one that we commonly will plant in our yards. And so to get the biggest diversity of them, you want the biggest diversity of plants that your yard can support and that belong there. Um, here's a question. You mentioned um, photographing on white sheets, and they're curious if you ever set up um, lights at night, moth lighting. Oh, yeah, or, that's or what I'm referring like to. So night lighting. Yes, I love okay. that. Um, and that's, in fact, some of the books, the pictures in, in my book are from night lighting because I just, they're hard to find, um, especially like the dirt colored seed bugs. Um, they often can, be, they're on the ground. I, you know, I'm, you know, five foot six. I'm not, you know, even when I get down, I'm not down on the ground. So it's hard for me to get really, really low and see those. Obviously, my eye goes to, you know, the flower height level. And so most of the bugs that I see during the daytime are at flower height level and checking the flowers out. So at night, it was so nice is to set up the white sheet, shine the bright lights. I have both mercury vapor and black lights that I use. And even the LED lights will work, but you just want to shine a bright light on a white sheet. And it's amazing the amount of different types of insects, not just moths. But true bugs, beetles, I mean, every spiders, frogs. I've not had any bats yet, but I've heard people have had bats come to the sheets. Uh, so you can get a lot of things. I've had a monarch come to my sheet at night. What the heck it's doing there, I don't know. I've, there is a nighttime bee. Um, there is a sweat bee that is somewhat nocturnal and it will come to the sheets at night. So just a really nice way and fun way. And plus it's a great activity to have people yeah. come and be able to share with them all the different things that come into the sheet. It's a lot easier yeah. to see them on a sheet than to crowd around one little plant, you know, and get a, you can be, yeah. get a bigger group in. We we host the, the moth lightings here at the Lamb Conservancy as well. And we have our, our leader is Judy Semrock, who's part of this program. And it is great fun to see what gets attracted awesome. to those sheets um, in the evening, what comes out of the woods and yeah. when you're closer to the forest, the species you get, it's really interesting. Um, okay, so this person's asking about info on bugs that may feed on quote, weed seeds such as dandelions or lesser celandine. I don't know as much. Like I said, I, I'm okay. focused on flowers and okay. I'm not that low. So I'm not, you know, collecting the seeds. I guess the best... The one thing I do normally when we have a cold winter instead, of, you know, 80 degrees in February, um, I have a basically a cover board people use for snakes. Um, I have a, basically a metal roofing sheet that I will flip over once it turns about 60 degrees and I will find a lot of these bugs, seed eating bugs underneath that. 
So I guess if I was going to do a study about that, that's what I would do. I would use metal cover boards mm -hmm. uh, with seeds and you could actually sprinkle the seeds underneath the cover board and flip it over and find out what's eating the seeds. So you could sprinkle dandelion seeds, different types of seeds. So that's how I would design that study. I have not done that study. <laughs> <laughs> Do you eradicate the orange and black aphids from your milkweed and golden Alexander? Um, not really, because they're food. Okay. Um, and so a lot of bugs will come and feed on those. And so I, okay. I watch them because I want to see what bugs are coming to feed on the aphids. But that's just another food source, essentially. It's just another offering uh, for the native bugs to, to feed on. And it's really cool. Have you seen the cartoon about the uh, cute little ladybugs, which I call lady beetles? You know, oh, how pretty they are. And they're in your close up. They're just ripping those aphids apart. And just kind of cool. <laughs> that is what they're doing. They're not that sweet. <laughs> Sweet. Um, everyone's asking about your downloadable sheets. Is there a link that you can send me that I can share to get those? Or uh, how yes, I can do that. But if you want okay. to just go on, type in Rapid Field Guides, okay. the Chicago Field Museum. Um, okay. And you can just type in, you know, flies, wasps. But I, I can actually share all that link. Um, I have a yeah. sheet all prepared somewhere that I can do that. But yeah, it's within the rapid field guides. When the guides were new, they just popped up. But now they're a few years old, so they don't pop up as closely. But, but okay. yeah. Well, I, I definitely will send a, not just fine, so. And I'll send a follow-up message with yeah. the, the link to that. And, and lastly, tell us um, where we can find your book. Is Amazon, I mean- It is on Amazon. Amazon? Um, Any other places? You can get it uh, usually at a little bit better discount of uh, straight through Pollinator Press. Pollinator Press. Type okay, in excellent. Pollinator Press right now because my book's the one that she's promoting, so it pops up. <laughs> okay, great. Because folks were asking where they can find it. Yeah. Um, I, I other think it's than going for Amazon. around twenty-four or twenty-five right now. So okay, it's got great. 300, 350 pages, over three hundred photographs. It's just packed with. The photograph photography was the main focus for me. I wanted to make sure I represented the bugs very well with photographs and tried to get the different flowers. But there's lists of all the different flowers that I've documented the different bug species on. Okay. Um, and that, that was one of the big contributions that I have because I mean I'm I'm not the I'm not an expert on bugs yet. I'm learning. Um, and so hopefully that book is out there to help everybody learn. There's a lot we don't know yet. We don't know what these all visit. I Honestly, there's so much we don't know in so many of these groups, especially when we get into Insecta. So thank you, Vanessa. She posted the Field Museum link. So All we right. have that in the chat right now. Um, and with that, we're going to transition to the next speaker. And oh. if we didn't get to your question, um, I'll share them with you, um, Angela, and we'll, we'll right. take care of them later. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. And we're so happy that we were able to get a hold of you and so get sorry. you <laughs> tuned in here. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so Trevor, I see you're here. Right there. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing great. Excellent. Well, I mean, we're a couple of minutes early, but I think it's just fine. So I, I am pleased to introduce Trevor Smith. He will pre be presenting Native Plants, Your Backyard, and Climate Change. So welcome, Trevor, to the program today. Thank you so very much. I'm excited to be here. Great. All Looks right. good. All right. We should be up. Yes. All right, so um, my name is Trevor Smith. I am the education director and design manager for Weston Nurseries in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, which is the start of the Boston Marathon. Uh, I have been, uh, before going to Weston, I had my own regenerative land care uh, design build business for over 20 years and uh, shifted careers because I wanted to focus more on education. So for about the past 12 years, uh, I've been delving more and more into education by the year. Um, and that's what brings me here to all of you. So today's presentation, 
essentially is, you know, you, me and climate change. It is uh, it is a fact. I will be giving it from a northeast perspective, um, but much, much of the information I'm going to share and many of the things we're going to talk about are global. So that part really doesn't make too, too much of a difference. Uh, and after hearing Angela just say 80 degrees in February, that's pretty much what we had. I mean, we just went uh, straight in, straight into spring uh, with, with some fluctuations. And I don't know what it's doing out there with you, but we have our first dry day in quite some time today. Uh, so that's been great. I feel like you guys have been sending us all your rain. We don't need any more. Thank you. The rivers are starting to come up over the roads. Uh, so that is, you know, that has always been spring, but spring has not, you know, has uh, always come a little slower and uh, winters haven't always been as wet. We didn't see any snow this winter. So just to dive right into things in 2021, but it happened again this past year. I was on a call with people recently evacuated from by wildfires and from flood. Uh, so back in 21, I was on a national uh meeting zoom call and there were people from texas staying in tennessee at relatives houses and there were people in california uh staying in hotels because of the wildfires that were pushing in and essentially the same exact scenario um happened to me this year in a different meeting uh where people were evacuated from flood and from wildfire and then still just jumped on and were taking their meetings as business as usual so um, I feel when you're dealing with climate change, um, there are essentially two approaches. Uh, one is the it is way too big for for me, for any one person to handle. We need all the corporations and all the governments to get together and save us all from, you know, from this Um I am going to, over the course of all this, talk about how each one of us can grassroots in our own backyard help offset climate change. Uh, the other perspective is more uh, akin to the frog in the pot. If you don't know that one, it's where if you put a frog in a pot of water and bring the temperature up slowly, uh, the frog will just keep adjusting to that temperature. Uh, so there are plenty of people who imagine climate change is going to be apocalyptic. Um, and because we are not at you know, uh, apocalyptic, what people would consider apocalyptic levels yet. Um, they're saying that climate change really isn't that serious. And uh, we still we still have time. I'm going to tell you that where I am in my little northeast corner of the country, the we are warming faster than the rest of the planet altogether because of where we're situated, because of where the tides are. Um, and uh, because of how climate flows across the uh, across the country, um, we are warming faster than the rest of everybody else. And what bums me out about that is that the temperatures and the way things were are never going to get back. And so that makes that makes me sad on one level and just uh, drives me on another level because no, it's never going to go back to the way it was. Uh, it's not like we're going to dismantle our cities. It's not like we're going to, you know, shrink our farms. We're not going to do any of that. So what we need to focus on is regaining that balance. And it's all, it is just all about balance. And we're currently out of balance. So now what? Well, we have to stop thinking about this. This is heartbreaking. This is sad. And this is real. Um, and if you would like, I am not saying don't send your money uh, to the organizations that help uh, offset climate change on a much larger level. However, I would suggest that you do not spend your time focusing on images like this and spend your time focusing on images like this. This happens to be my favorite native bee, the green sweat bee. Um, and she is on the verge, at least in the Northeast, of potentially being endangered in certain communities, uh, along with many other pollinators. So I would rather take, say, the $20 that I was going to send to the climate action groups that are going to help offset whatever's happening um, on, a, on a global scale and take that same $20 and put a plant in my yard that could potentially support 37 different species of uh, pollinators. Uh, and then from there, you support everybody who feeds and, and thrives on those pollinators. So it, for me, it comes down to where you're putting your $20. And like I said, if you want to put your $20 into both, that's great. But for me, the $20 well spent is the one that's got dropping right into my backyard to save my local ecosystem and habitat. 
The days of landscaping for beauty alone are over. We've done that. We were trusted with nice things and um, we went a little too overboard. At least, uh, and again, I'm speaking from the Northeast perspective, but from being out in Kansas City and Chicago, it seems to be uh, the same across the board. So currently our approach, the green industry, so the landscape industry, uh, and many, many uh, who work with the land and work with the landscape, you know, our current approach to uh, to the landscape, to our lawns, to our gardens, is akin to sending plastic and rubber and steel to a factory without knowing who works there or even what they need and hoping a car comes out the other side. This is this the the prime example is any four step that you would be putting on your lawn so you can have wonderful grass on your lawn. Do you know that you're, you know, do you know that your grass and your soil, do you know if it needs anything in that second step without doing a test and without knowing your property a little bit better, without knowing your plants a little bit better? Uh, you're not going to know that. And so we get sucked in, in both the professional community and I, I find, you know, in, in the consumer and residential community, we all get sucked in by these silver bullets, by these bright, colorful bags with big promises. Um, and so we just are looking for something rather than knowing our garden, rather than observing, we're just looking to open a open a bag or, you know, take a, you know, pull out a bottle and it'll just handle everything for us. And that's not necessarily the case. I'm not saying that each and every person on here needs to be a botanist, entomologist, horticulturist, or anything like that. But um, with a little bit of observation and a little more forethought, we can definitely drill down. Um, and then as far as, you know, our plant communities are concerned, you know, I think, again, we'll get into this in a little bit, but finding that balance is uh, extremely important. Our view or how we use the word sustainability, and this happens a lot even in, in my current company, but um, I think in general is extremely blurry. So we, when we use the word sustainability, in our head, we feel, you know, we might feel like we're doing the best thing. We might feel righteous. We might feel like, you know, we are, we are just doing so much good, but our actions speak differently. So our current actions, our current approach to sustainability is how much can I take before I break it? How far can I push this before it's too far? And so when we're practicing sustainability, many of our practices are really like, how close to the edge can I get? Uh, and that's that's not really how it feels when we say it. And when we talk about the word, um, that's not how we really mean it, but that's exactly how our practices are. I promise you, this is not a depressing uh, presentation whatsoever. I'm just trying to get us all on the same page. So I started off by saying that I'm a regenerative land care professional. What that means is, it's kind of like an eco landscaper, but what that means is uh, all of my practices, all of my installations, everything that I do focuses on rebuilding the soil and restoring, regenerating the soil, regenerating the hydrology and regenerating the native or the uh, or just the, the plant communities. So a better way to put this is if you look at our current climate situation, our current landscape situation and our current practices, like having the flu. Well, you don't want to talk about sustainability now because if you're sick, you don't want to feel like crap forever. You want to regenerate. You want to get healthy again and then sustain. So to a regenerative land care professional, sustainability is actually a goal that we are looking to achieve, not something that we are currently practicing now. We want to heal Mother Nature. We want to restore that balance, get those systems back online, then get out of the way because once that balance is back, Mother Nature can take care of herself. She doesn't need all of our, our fiddling and all of our inputs. However, right now, she does need our help to restore that balance. We need to get it straight on what we consider ecosystem services and uh, what, this is, what this is all about. So ecosystem services, by definition, include provisioning services such as food and water, regulating services such as flood and disease control, cultural services such as spiritual, recreational and cultural benefits, and supportive services such as nutrient cycling and maintaining the conditions for life here on earth. And this is what our ecosystems, this is what our different habitats all provide for us. Ecosystem services, these are pretty much all things that we cannot do 
on our own without the assistance of nature. We need nature and we need to work in concert with nature and the, the services that she provides. So for this presentation, I will be discussing soil, hydrology, and uh, and plants and, and nature itself, or the animals, the flora and the fauna. Um, these are the really just the three base layers. They seem extremely basic. Much of what you are going to hear me say and cover, you're going to look at and be like, wow, that was basic. I am going to argue that it is because we've strayed so far from the basics, overcomplicated things, or thought we knew better that we made so many mistakes and strayed so far from, you know, from just the baseline. So let us just start with soil. Soil, the answer beneath our feet. It is the one thing, uh, soil, when I started 25 years ago in my, in this industry, uh, on, out on my own, uh, in going to conferences and in reading all the books, soil was the one thing I stayed away from because to me, soil meant math. To me, soil meant chemistry. Uh, and those in school were not necessarily my strong suit. It wasn't until I started realizing how soil works, how plant works, how plants work, uh, and then how you mix hydrology in there that I really got into soil and realized it really isn't that hard. It's as complicated as you want to make it. You are going to hear me throughout this presentation uh, compare, you know, nature, whether it be soil, water, or plants, to people. Um, that is because I found that a very simple way to understand things. So the soil matter makeup is we have the mineral component, which is the sand, silt, and clay. That is where all the minerals are. Then we have the air and water holding capacities of the soil. These are extremely important. And these are, these are the two areas, the soil, the pore space in the soil or the soil aggregates is, is really where we've dropped the ball or just kind of turned a blind eye. And then we have the soil organic matter, which is also extremely important. One of the biggest unrecognized contributors to the climate crisis is compaction. And this is why I was saying we are not paying attention to the air and water space or that pore space within the soil. Preventing compaction or overcompaction should be the number one thing on our minds if we are hiring a contractor and having them come to our property. And if you are in the industry, it should be the number one thing on your mind, preventing the compaction of the soil. Um, because if you run a bobcat over somebody's property or if somebody runs a mini excavator to get to your backyard to help build that addition, they're likely compacting your soil two to three feet down. And that you are not going to decompact with just a lawn aerator. Uh, that is one step that you will need to take to do so. But if you could prevent that major compaction in the first place, that would be key. So why is compaction such a threat to uh, to climate change? And why do I say that? Well, because it really throws off our hydrology because we've now lost the water holding capacity of the soil. Because of that, because you're cramping down on the on the water holding capacity and the and the pore space within the soil, you are reducing the soil's ability and the plant's ability to facilitate carbon sequestration, which is what we're looking for when we're talking about climate change more often than not. You also limit biodiversity. When I talk about biodiversity, I'm talking about biodiversity above and below ground. Now, just to quick, quickly refer to this picture over here, this is what, as a designer, I don't see normally. This is what I have to see, though, when I arrive at this house. By the time I get to this house, this family's going to be, they're all going to be moved in. There's going to be a nice foundation planting and some green grass on the lawn. And they're going to say, hey, we moved in a year ago or six months ago. You know, we'd really like to kind of put our own, you know, feel to the landscape because we're not thrilled with what the contractor special that came in. Or it's a year later and they're like, we'd really like to focus on the landscape. We've been focusing on inside for so long. And we also are having a whole lot of problems with water and things just keep dying on our property. Well, what any designer needs to know or what that homeowner should realize is that if you go below the four inches of topsoil that the contractor put down so that they could grow grass on the front lawn, you essentially have concrete. This is already a good you know, four to six inches down from grade. 
And then you've now compacted, as you can see, that cat has compacted the soil down to two to three feet. So the first thing I would suggest in coming to a brand new brand new home like this is I would, I would do a test, a soil test. Um, but I would be suggesting, you know, soil remediation before we try to put many or any plants in whatsoever. A friend of mine said to said to me, it's one of my favorite things, and it's also in her, in one of her books. I've never seen a nitrogen deficient plant in in a natural ecosystem. Obviously, there's something wrong with the way we're doing agriculture. She was dealing with agriculture. I would say landscape, the same thing. That's interfering with the biological fixation of nitrogen. And it's absolutely true. Tell me a time that you've gone into a forest and you've ever seen a nitrogen deficient plant. However, those bags tell us this is exactly what we need to, to you know, to say to save our plants. Well, I'm going to argue again through the soil that it is not that that we need to focus on our soil and the soil carbon sponge. The big difference between conventional and regenerative landscaping is whether or not you're treating the soil like a living organism that consistently needs to be fed carbon via living plant roots. We don't think about the soil enough and in the right way. And it all starts with the big exchange. Well, it all starts with photosynthesis and then the soil starts with the big exchange. So our plants through photosynthesis create sugar or carbon, and then they feed that sugar, 20 to 80% of it into the soil to feed the soil organisms, the hyphae, the protozoa, the fungi, the bacteria. So that's also carbon. And that is really what carbon sequestration is. So through photosynthesis, you know, they, the, 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 the process of photosynthesis pulls off the oxygen and throws out the oxygen and uses the carbon to, you know, the carbon dioxide in the air to create, like I said, this is very basic, to create a sugar. You're creating a base sugar. That sugar gets pushed out into the ground to feed the soil organisms. Oops, sorry. So that, so that carbon is getting pushed into the soil, carbon sequestration, to feed the soil organisms that are also carbon. And by increasing the, the soil organisms, you're sequestering carbon. So this is how that all works. For every one gram of carbon sequestered, we can hold eight grams of water. This is very important when we're trying to, a very something very important to think about when we're trying to create a climate resilient landscape. This is another friend of mine. This is something that we don't think about enough. Plants don't have the ability to digest soil. We think that just because like in this picture, those plant roots are touching that soil, that the plant is able to take up all of its vitamins and minerals from the soil. That's not the case. That plant needs either a relationship with, the, with all of its friends in the soil, it needs to build, be a part of the soil community or the soil microbiome. And here we have nematodes, we have protozoa, we have hyphae, and we have bacteria. So the fungi and all the bacteria and single-celled or multi-celled organisms in the soil, these are what digest the sand, silt, and clay. These are what form a relationship with the root system. And this is how the plant gets its vitamins and minerals, not by touching the soil. Now, in much of agriculture and in landscaping, we've bypassed this, bypassed all of the, the relationship with the community and started adding fertilizer, which then says, makes the plant say, okay, I don't need any friends. I have this. So if you look at it kind of like a drug addiction, which is dark and I'm sorry, but that's kind of what it is. It's saying, I don't need any friends or any community. I have everything I need right here. And that's kind of what we've, what we've done. The plant will do absolutely fine if you have enough soil life to be feeding it and to process the soil that you have and all the minerals you have. Healthy soil is full of life. In fact, it is the most biodiverse place on earth. When the soil food web is activated, diverse plants and animals will return above ground, to above ground and below ground uh, and those ecosystems can be or habitats can be restored. Again, it's all very basic, but here's another little piece. For every 1% of soil organic matter, 
the soil will hold 20 to 25,000 gallons of water per acre. Now, I live just outside of Boston on a little tiny postage stamp. So I can't imagine 20 to 25,000 gallons of water being held on my property. However, for every 1% of organic matter, so if you have, if you do a soil test or have your soil looked at and you're at 5%, you just go to 6%. And now you've increased your water holding capacity exponentially. Now, if you can get over 6%, as, as I found out here at least, I can go about 90 days on my property and the properties that I manage and have managed for a long time that have built up the soil organic matter to 6 7%. Once you get into that range, I can go 90 days between rainstorms. And will the, will the landscape suffer? Absolutely. Will the plants die? No, not at all. So in the Northeast, two years ago, last summer, it never stopped raining. The year before that, it never rained. So the year before that, these this this these past two seasons were the perfect test for these theories that I'm talking about right now. Two years ago, when it never rained, I'll just talk about my personal landscape. Could I have gone on a garden tour? Absolutely not. Everything was looking pretty miserable, but it wasn't dry and dead. It just you know, the flowers were piddly. I did have some insect pressure because my plants were stressed. But then the following spring, everything came back just fine. Last year, like I said, it never stopped raining. Well, with that extra water holding capacity, I didn't really have soggy soils or any flooding in my property or many of the properties that I manage. Uh, so you can see that by boosting your soil organic matter, whether you have drought or if you have very rainy seasons, you are going to create a climate resilient landscape because the water will either be there or the water will have a place to go. Which brings us to water. This right here is one of my favorite pictures. This is a 700 year old bubble uh, in a glacier. I only have two two items on my bucket list, so I have a very sad bucket list. One was to see the glaciers before they melted, uh, and that's where I took this picture. The other is to see the monarchs in Mexico, which uh, the way things are going is probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so I guess I'm going to live forever because I'll never be able to complete my bucket list, but that is uh, that seems to be the case at the moment. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is that since 1980, the number of extreme meteorological events has doubled. It is happening more and more. Our weather is becoming more erratic. Our weather is becoming more extreme as the climate changes. As I told you, we're gonna get real basic. We're gonna go right back to the beginning. And I want you to just take a look at this graphic. So you can see the evapotrans, this is the natural water cycle. So if you went to a, a untouched woodland or watershed, this is what you would see. The surface runoff all the way over there on the left, less than 1%. The interflow, the water that's making its way into the soil and moving through the soil is at 20 to 30%. That evapotranspiration, 40 to 50%. In a situation like this, this is Mount Katahdin up in Maine. In a natural ecosystem, it will rain here. And as it rains here, all those trees and all those leaves are going to catch that water and gently set it to the ground. And then from there, it's going to take days, weeks, maybe even months from the top of the mountain for that water to make its way all the way to the lake. In a natural ecosystem, that water will go gently to the ground, into the soil, and then gravity will take it all the way down to the lake. But that is going to take days, weeks, and months. In our urban water cycle, you can see massive changes here. So the surface runoff went from less than 1% to 20 to 30%. That evapotranspiration went down from 40 to 50, to 20 to 30. Why? There's less vegetation to transpire the water that's in the ground. That interflow is zero to 30, down from 20 to 30. So you can see that in this situation, in the urban situation, it's very different. Why? Because Mother Nature created each and every one of the waterways 
to be able to handle flooding, a flooding event, a large storm event. They would swell. But that is because the water took days and months to get there. Now, all of our water is going right down a storm drain and right into our waterways, which is why we have all of the flooding. That and because we changed many of our waterways. This is where I live. We have a whole lot of issues just like this. Now, the, the problem where I see the problem with this is not that there is flooding, because what the town will say, what the news will say, what anybody that you're probably talking to will say is that we have a flooding problem here in Arlington, Massachusetts. No, we have an infiltration problem here in Arlington, Massachusetts. So if we call it what it is, then we will be able to solve it. If we call it a flooding problem, we're just going to try to get rid of the water. If we call it an infiltration problem, then we are going to look to infiltrate that water. <sighs> That's what I see everywhere. Where is that water going? This is how we deal with our storm water right now. And like I said, it, we send our flood water where? Away? If anybody can show me away on a blue marble floating in space, please do. Because all, is, all we're doing right now is taking our flood waters and sending it into our streams, our rivers, our lakes, our bays. We are just... You know, just sending that water elsewhere because we're dealing with flooding and not infiltration. This is kind of how we're dealing with many of our climate problems. We're just kind of throwing it in the closet and closing the door. It looks clean enough. This is how we deal with flooding. There's no water on the street. No, we've just totally polluted this the stream that's right next to the street. We've totally polluted our river, which is now running out and creating dead zones. What I've been dealing with, we're working with for over 15 years now uh, is nature-based solutions. And this is where I feel we are going to find the balance through green infrastructure, especially in our municipalities, but also uh, within our homes and residences. Then, so green infrastructure, it, the, pr the practice of it is mimicking the natural water cycle. So what we are trying to do is slow the velocity reduce the volume and infiltrate the water. And that is what each and every single one of these things do. A bioretention bioretention system on a small scale is called a rain garden. On a large scale is called bioretention or a bioswale. And then we have our porous asphalts and our permeable pavements. That is another way of just getting the water. That's that's how you find the balance. We have, we're getting the water into the ground to recharge our aquifer, but we're still able to have our driveways. And then green roofs are just another way of mimicking the watershed where when it rains, the green roof will slow how fast the water rolls off the roof and into the storm drain. And the water that does roll off the roof and into the storm drain will be cleaned by the green roof itself. So it's mimicking what would happen in that watershed, like that picture of Mount Katahdin I showed you. So green infrastructure is what I focused on. Green infrastructure is you know, what I teach entire courses on. And, and work with many cities and municipalities, but focusing on bioretention, which is holding water and allowing it to infiltrate porous asphalt, allowing that water to infiltrate and green roofs or finding ways to hold water uh, to allow it to infiltrate slowly is what we need to focus on, which then brings us to plants. Plant the change you wish to see in the world is kind of what I've been saying to people and saying uh, quite some time, because as I say to my second graders, we want to see more of this. So I teach um, pollinators and native plants to elementary kids. And every time I show this picture, I say, does anybody know anybody who's a messy eater at home? And you should see how many hands just shoot up and everybody can't wait to tell me about their younger brother or sister who is just an absolute mess. So where does that bring us with plants? Well, let me guess. Natives, yes, you are correct. So why native plants? Well, we actually just heard, learned all about that uh, on, the, on the prior presentation. Now we know why native plants. But native plants do play a massive role for us. So native plants and planting native, whatever that might be to our area, 
is going to increase climate resilience. It's going to increase climate resilience because native plants to our area, especially if we get ecotypic native plants, um, will be more adapted to our climate, to our weather, to our soils. So if you're not familiar with the term ecotypic, it means it is a native plant that was grown from a seed. A, so a local plant grown from a, a local seed grown from a local plant. I'm sorry, that came out all weird. So a local plant grown from a local seed. So here we have the Men Menarda punctata. So if we collected, if this seed was here uh, in Massachusetts or out in your backyard and you collected that seed, that seed would have the memory of last summer's weather, whatever your weather was last summer. It would have that the memory of last summer's weather and your soil imprinted on its genome. So it would be more prepared for whatever this year's conditions are going to be than if you brought in Menarda punctata from South Carolina or if you brought it in from Massachusetts. That would have the memory of last year's Massachusetts weather, and it would have the Massachusetts soil conditions imprinted on its genome. That's not saying that it won't live in your garden. It just says that it's going to there's going to be an adaption period. And it's, just think about anybody anytime you've moved. There's a certain period of time that you need to get established, and that is longer if your plant is not ecotypic. So if you can source ecotypic plants, that's excellent. And the more we can grow native and grow ecotypic, the, the more climate resilient uh, our plants and landscapes will be. Habitat support. And I said, just think Yellowstone. Most everybody's heard, you know, what happened to Yellowstone once they brought the wolves back. That's like the most magnificent example. But similar examples can happen in our backyard. You know, um, it, as was said in that last presentation, you know, if you start putting in these native plants, and you can put in native plants first, you know, and try to attract specific insects. You can't really choose. You probably will get somebody that you weren't looking for. However, for instance, like if you put in milkweed, you'll draw the monarchs. Um, you might you might get somebody else that you weren't looking for, but you know, you'll definitely get your monarchs. All, all I'm saying is by putting it in, they will come. And that was absolutely just said by the previous speaker. Fewer inputs. It's absolutely true with native plants. They're not no maintenance especially in a composed garden or the built environment. You, you, you're you never just going to set it and forget it. You are going to have to edit. You're going to have to weed. You're going to have to cut your garden back at some point in time, uh, unless you have a property where you can absolutely just let it go. That all being said, if you leave the leaves in the fall and you allow, if you cut back your stems and allow them to decompose on site, you will not need to be adding fertilizer. You do not, at, you know, none of the native plants, at least in the Northeast, want really uh, super sweet soils. They want the crappy soils of the Northeast. We have rocky acidic soil and they love it here. Healthy plants equal increased carbon cycling. Now we're getting down into, you know, what happens, you know, when we're talking about climate change. So the more your plant can photosynthesize, the more carbon it is going to draw and sequester. Yes, your little backyard can play a huge role in carbon sequestration. The other piece that ties all into this, when you have proper good hydrology and you have good soil and a good soil microbiome, then you will have plants with healthier ecosystems, uh, healthier immune systems. So if you look at, and like I said, this is when I started comparing nature to people, it all started to make sense. If you think about your microbiome and all the pro and prebiotics, and you think about the soil microbiome, our microbiome's on the inside, a plant's microbiome's on the outside. Its roots are in the microbiome, our microbiome is inside of us. Both of them need pre and probiotics. Both of them, we both need through food or through whatever, we need to feed the good bugs. When we feed the good bugs, we have a healthy immune system and we don't get sick. If your plant is photosynthesizing at full capacity, it works in the landscape, it's been proven in the landscape, and it's been proven in, in farmland. If you have plants that have all the nutrients they need, and they are photosynthesizing at their full capacity, they will be resistant to nibbling insects. They will be resistant to decimation. Your garden should be nibbled. Somebody should be eating something. If not, you're doing it wrong. However, if your plants are being decimated, 
That is because something is wrong with the environment. It's either the wrong plant in the wrong place. There is either climate stress or the soil is not right for that plant or the hydrology isn't right for that plant. But if your plant is being decimated, it's because something's wrong with the environment. An insect's job is to remove the weak plants. It is to go through and remove the weak plants so the strong plants can survive. So for instance, at Weston Nurseries, in our display garden, there are two of the perennial hibiscus right on the side, right on the edge of the parking lot. Those look like my grandmother's doily every single year. They just get eaten to nothing but lace uh, every single year. And that's because they're miserable. They're there. They're not happy. I watch them every year. I photograph them almost every single year. And it's good because it's the perfect you know, way to prove that this is the, you know, this plant is not in the right place because in our other display gardens, the hibiscus do just fine. But with all that salt, all that sand, all that heat coming off the parking lot, they are not happy plants. So I, I, I digress, I'm sorry, but that's how it all plays into it, the carbon cycling, et cetera. Biodiversity was just talked about and this I can't advocate for enough. Now, some of you might be looking at this picture and freaking out. Uh, this might look a little too chaotic and way too messy for you. Totally understand that. What's beautiful about this is all of the biodiversity. When you have this many types of plants, you will have a number of insects. And some of those insects are going to eat the insects that you do not want, the undesirables, otherwise known as pests. So if you have a number of different plants and not a monoculture and not just a handful of this, that, and the other thing, if you have biodiversity within your garden, you will have a number of different insects and all of those different insects will bring a number of different birds. So you will have massive amounts of wildlife in your garden. You will also have fewer pest problems. You will also have fewer weed problems. So now what I've done or what I do and what I teach in a different class is how to take this and make it into a composed meadow. So if you think of all of these textures and all of these different flowers in big swaths and tied together like paisley, then it's a little easier on the eye for those that if this hurts your sensibilities, it makes it a lot easier, but you still have that biodiversity. If you just have onesies, twosies, you're not going to bring the wildlife, the pollinators, whether it be bees or butterflies, uh, and then by default, you're not going to have all the birds that you want if you just have a lot of onesie twosies. If you plant in swaths, if you plant in, you know, en masse a little bit, whether that be, you know, groups of threes or sixes, then you'll be much better off. Um, just, you know, as a design thing, I don't know how any of you design. So just I will just put this out there that um, we have evolved to find repetition in nature. So if you just have a one of something and it doesn't ever repeat in your garden, ultimately in the end, your garden is going to look a little bit chaotic just like this. I go all the time to people's houses and they're like, I just, I go and I just buy whatever I see and whatever I fall in love with. And now I don't know what to do with my yard. It just doesn't look right. And it's because they have like one or two of everything just kind of all over the place. If you plant in groups, whether it be threes or larger, and then repeat elsewhere in the garden. So if you picture a long garden bed, and let's just say you do a group of five over on the left, and then do a smaller group of three, as your eye scans, your eye is going to see, say this black-eyed Susan, this Rudbeckia, your eye is going to see that and instantly try to find it again. And when it does, then you will remain calm and you will find the garden aesthetically beautiful. If it can't find it again, in the back of your mind, it's gonna be freaking out. So. Repetition and swaths in groups is what you want to do. Biodiversity is what we want to go for. As many different types of plants as possible because it also plays into underground. So with all of the different root depths, the really, I don't believe too much in plant competition. I don't believe all these roots are in competition. Um, but with all of these different root depths, if you think about the big exchange that we were talking about earlier, these roots will be feeding the soil life deeper and deeper into the soil. At many different depths of the soil, these roots will be pushing those sugars out and feeding that soil life. Water also travels down the roots as it rains and as it goes into the soil, it follows the roots. 
So the more different root depths you have and the more types of plants you have, the more depths the water is going to make it to. And also the more soil volume in areas the plants will be able to draw from uh, in times of need, in times of drought. So by having that biodiversity above you will, and having that biodiversity below, you will create that climate resistant landscape um, that you're looking for. And by having all of that, again, if you go back to this, as I said, you will not have too many weeds and this, you won't, you won't need a whole lot of mulch either in situations like this, because all of those plants have now grown together. Uh, they are protecting the soil. They are catching the water as it rains and setting it down gently and then processing that water at all the different depths. Then if you leave the leaves and leave all that biomass, if you just chop it up and let it decompose, now all the minerals that have been drawn up from the year before are going to be right there and they're going to act as your fertilizer. And eventually you're not gonna need to buy those bags at all. So why does all of this matter? Well, 98 million acres of this lovely country uh, has been, the native vegetation has been replaced by managed landscapes. Your property, my property, it all falls into this, which equals land larger than our national parks and all of the land used in 2014 for corn production combined. So if you've ever been to a national park and thought, wow, this is enormous, well, all of our little backyards add up to land much greater than all of those national parks altogether. So you're like, okay, well, that's a big number. And I kind of see where you're going with that. But what does that mean? Well, because we're not really necessarily planting for wildlife, because we're planting for beauty, because we're throwing things at our, at our properties without knowing exactly what it needs, um, there has been a massive decline in insect diversity. And that has led to the decline in the bird populations. So it takes um, it takes chickadees, 9,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch of five. So chickadees are one of my favorites. Um, they were my favorites because they were my grandmother's favorites, I think. Um, we always loved watching the chickadees together and we always listened for the chickadee song to change uh, in winter and spring. So, uh, but 9,000 9, caterpillars for two tiny little birds to, you know, to feed five tinier birds. And so we need to have those caterpillars out there. And those caterpillars are not on our non-native plants. They're going to be found on our native plants. <clears throat> so we need to think about that. That the plants you choose could save a species. Now, these three ladies right here, I'm not 100% sure in your area, but these three ladies are either locally extinct or endangered across the Northeast. So these are three different specialist bumblebee species. And due to loss of habitat and because they're the plants that they specialize on are not always our favorites to put in the garden, uh, they are, like I said, locally endangered or locally extinct. So what has driven me since the beginning, when I started my business, I was just like, well, of course I'm going to be organic because I'm working with the earth. So why wouldn't I be organic? And then, as I was saying, when I was choosing plants, I could look at this one plant and be like, this plant looks great to me and my client's really going to like this and it'll live here and it'll be fine. Or I could choose this plant and it looks great to me. My client's really going to like it. It'll live in this garden. It'll be fine. And it'll support 37 other species of bees and butterflies. So I could put in the one that's just going to look great to my client and I, and maybe like the honeybees will visit it. Or I could put in this one and support 37 different species. So why wouldn't I choose that one? So then it just kind of became a challenge, like a personal challenge to myself on, you know, how how much wildlife can I support in like a, a little teeny tiny urban garden? Like how many different species of butterflies and bees can I support and how much food can I create? So these will probably also apply to your area um, in, in to some extent, because some of these are native uh, across the board. Uh, but by planting any one of these, at least for us here, by planting any one of these, so Monarda didyma, which is the red Monarda, which everybody puts in because they want to have the hummingbirds. So why not put that in? Because it will support those three ladies I was just talking about, the pen stem and the beard tongue. That is a very common plant. It's a beautiful plant. 
We just have to think about working it in. If you work these in, you're going to support those endangered bee species as well as a number of other species that may not necessarily be endangered. As I said, if nothing's eating your garden, something's wrong. So we want we want those caterpillars every single year, end of June. And it's it's like clockwork, and it's become a it's it's forever been wherever when I had my own company, and even now it's just a joke in the office. End of June, every single year, I will get a call from somebody who I just put a pollinator garden in for. And they're gonna they'll say, Trevor, I have caterpillars and there's something eating everything in the in the garden. Like, what do I do? What do I what do, what spray do I need? And I have to kindly explain to them where butterflies come from and that that was the goal that if they want to have the butterflies they need to have the caterpillars it's always an awkward conversation because i haven't found the perfect way to say it um to explain it to anybody so a place to start this is something that you could check out because some of our plants are mutual um but it's just also something to to just check out and look at so on the western nurseries website if you go there, there are seven very teeny gardens. No, um, there I just I developed seven native plant gardens, uh, and you can see by the colors of the circles and by the colors of the plant in the in the image that is the color of the bloom. So there's a hummingbird garden. There's a garden designed for endangered bee species. There's a garden designed for birds. There's one designed for the hell strip, which is between the sidewalk and the street that. Two in, that two foot space that nothing can grow and that all the dogs pee on. There's a native garden that I've, I've worked on and designed for that that is salt and pee resistant. Um, so it's just something to check out. As I said, you know, I know all of our natives aren't all of your natives, but there is definitely some crossover and at least it's a good starting point uh, for you to check out. So if you go to the Western Nurseries website, go under native plants, you'll see those gardens that I developed. But how will all of this that we're talking about save the world? This is a very good question. I am glad you asked. Boom, fifth grade. It's all we needed. Like I said, let's go right back to the basics. 95% of the Earth's heating and cooling is controlled by the hydrologic cycle. That's really all we need to know. Because now we've, we've just decided, we've just said to ourselves, well, if we get our, our hydrology soil and our plants right, and restore the hydrologic cycle, we'll be good. 25% of solar radiation is transferred back into the atmosphere through transpiration. What does that mean? That means the more green space we have and the more evapotranspiration we have, the more solar radiation we are reflecting back into the atmosphere. And it is not heating up our, heating up our earth. One third of solar radiation is reflected back by clouds. So by having all of these impervious surfaces in our urban environments, by having bare soil and naked soil on our farmland due to questionable farming practices, all of this is creating a heat island effect. All of this is holding that heat in and holding it down and warming our planet. So back again, by cultivating green spaces, we can have that evapotranspiration and we can have local clouds. We can have those sun showers that that do in the morning that is supposed to be on your lawn and supposed to be on your plants. If it's not there, that is because the heat island effect has actually choked out that that uh, short water cycle is what it's called. So we just need to have those local clouds. Those local clouds in part are brought on by healthy hydrology. We all know that plants need rain, but rain actually needs plants. It needs that water to go back up in the air. It needs that water in the soil. And it needs to have that exchange, you know, with the plants, with the, the local water supplies, our lakes and rivers. It's not all about what comes off the ocean and what moves across the country or what comes off the Great Lakes and what moves across the country. It's that short water cycle. It's that it's that water that's in the soil. It's that regenerating or regenerative dew in the morning. So plants, plants and rain, they need each other and we need them both. Although right now I could use a little less rain. So here, just before questions, when we think about how do we tackle this? Again, it sounds immense. However, if we're waiting for all the, all the nations of the world to agree on something, if we're waiting for all of the companies to just hurry up and, and do something and save us, 
probably not going to happen as fast as we need. So I'm going to argue that we can just start taking action in our own backyards. I personally affect over 100 acres a season. Between all the people I see and all the jobs I put in, that's that's 100 acres a season. So if I can take 100 acres each year and re help, help restore the soil, the hydrology, and the plant communities there, that's that's a massive impact. And I'm doing it at my own house. So we have 101 eighth acres uh, that, uh, you know, that I'll be working on this year. So that's a huge impact. So if we do it on our own, or if you're in this professionally, think about all the acres that you touch. And if you can focus on that, then we can do this. So I don't think we should wait. I think we should just start now and, and start by, by fixing our own communities. So the big thing here is just, this is one of my favorite quotes. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. How does this apply to the landscape? Well, if we start putting pollinator gardens in, if we start putting rain gardens in and they look really beautiful uh, and our neighbors or people coming by, you know, start seeing that and seeing how beautiful that composed meadow I was talking about or seeing how beautiful that rain garden is that's working. Or if you have an opportunity to do a public project at the library or somewhere in town, you know, and you can get a sign there saying, hey, this is what's happening, then people are going to want to adopt that. If your neighbor sees, as my neighbor saw, and now she does exactly what I do, saw all the birds and all the different butterflies and stuff in my backyard, and our fences just bump right up to each other. But I had all these birds in my yard and she wanted all those birds in her yard. And that's, I told her this is why, because I have constant seeds, I have constant insects, I have everything available that a bird could want, as well as cover. So they can just kind of either raise their young or just go and, and find some place to hide. So by building these landscapes that I've been talking about, we can not only improve the climate, but we can also create that new model that's going to make the old model, the old way of things, the four-step way of doing things obsolete. If you don't believe me on how this works, think about your cell phone. After two, three years, you start to feel like your cell phone or any electronic is obsolete because the new one does so much more. So they do it to us all the time with tech. They come up with a new one and they make the old one obsolete. We need to do that in landscape. We need, to, we need to show people that rain gardens, that meadows, that native plants all work. They're all beautiful and they can all, they can all play a role. So with that, I thank you so very much. And I would also like to share uh, all of my contact information and please feel free to use it. I work with people out in the Midwest on, on stormwater projects and their native plant and planting projects. So people reach out to me all the time uh, from, ac from across the country just to talk things through. I want you to be successful. Uh, and so I will do anything I can to make sure that you're successful in your either a very small garden project or a giant bioswale that's going into your community. I'd be more than happy to help you with it. And with that, I will take any of your questions. Thank you so very much. Thanks so much, Trevor. I uh, appreciate your facts and I love how you keep it real. <laughs> it's good stuff. Okay, so you know we do have questions as you can imagine. I, I hope um, so. <laughs> okay, so um, it's gonna jump around a little bit though. Um, okay. What effect does using um, lasagna, um, you know, the cardboard and, and wood chips to kill weeds have on the ecology of the soil, if you know? Okay, so if you're doing the lasagna method with cardboard, uh, you will definitely choke out the weeds and suppress the, the the weed seeds. So it's a wonderful method if you can do it, or if you know if you have the time and if you have the 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 patience with it, um, it is it is definitely effective. Um, and so I would I I certainly I certainly advocate for it. If you okay. sol solarize uh, by putting tarps down and the like, uh, that will perform the same, um, the same function, but it will also kill many of the, uh, many of the organisms in the soil that can't move and those that can will leave. So there will be some regeneration that will have to happen if you solarize your soil. The lasagna method, not so much. Okay, great. Um, any suggestions on how to regenerate soil after um, compaction? 
So uh, how I do it after we we work on somebody's property first, I take methods, I put down boards or the, or the like. Uh, mm -hmm. If the compaction's already happened, usually what I will do is I will aerate with a lawn aerator. If I can't do deep tine, if I don't have like a broad fork or a deep tine aerator, I will use an aerator and then I will get um, compost in over that and rake some compost in. The compost will help feed the soil life and will help open up the soil over time. You just really have to, for deep compaction, nature really has to take over. Um, sometimes I will speed it up by doing the aeration, putting down compost, and then spraying a compost tea that has some blackstrap molasses in it. So the blackstrap molasses is straight sugar. And so what you'll do is you will cause this feeding frenzy. The, the sugar will cause a bacterial bloom and everybody that eats the bacteria will come and eat that. And then everybody who eats them and eats them. So you have this feeding frenzy. So it's a way to kind of fast forward the process. Eventually when all the sugar is used up, they'll, everybody will go, they'll either be dead or they'll leave or, you know, and some will stick around, but it's a way to, I guess, add a patina to the soil or fast forward the soil, uh, the soil uh, de decompaction process uh, a little more, but by the, you know, the best way to do that in an existing landscape is a very similar to met method to that. If you have, uh, let's just say um, that that property that I showed you with the cat that was all done, if, if they weren't going to move in quite, quite yet, I would use something like daikon radish as a cover crop because that will go about eight to 10 inches down in the soil. It'll blow the soil open. It'll die over the course of the winter. So then you'll have this organic matter in these deep tubes. So you have that organic matter, you've decompacted the soil eight to 10 inches down. So the water can get down there, the organic matters down there, and then I would plant. So that's like, if I have a whole season to do it, sure. I'll use something like the daikon radish. Yeah, I mean, that's much easier going that route, but it just takes longer, so. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, in regards to local ecotype seeds, would seed source from over 300 miles away be considered local ecotype? Um, it's, so ecotype is going to play more into your eco region. Okay. So it's not necessarily your hardiness zone. It is more your eco region. I don't know how they break out in the, in the, in, you know, in the middle. Um, but like we have, three eco regions here in the Northeast. We have the, you know, mm -hmm. we have the plains that are right there on the ocean, very sandy. Then we have the coastal kind of area, um, which is just rocky, you know, acidic soil. And then we have like right. our high plains areas, um, which are more like, you know, mountainous. So each one of those, like, there are plants that cross over. Mm -hmm. um, but if, you if you're getting plants within your eco region, okay. then those seeds will be adapted because each eco region has very similar soil, very similar plant communities, very similar climate. So if yes. you get you source your plants or your plant seed from your eco region, that's fine. So 300 miles away may still be within your eco region and that's okay. Yeah. And I actually, I, in the follow-up email, I will share the maps of the eco regions. I remember doing that from a, a previous talk. So I'll do that again for folks. Um, biochar, is it a good idea? Yes, it is. Just don't, don't get human with it and by the way i mean human with it is that we feel that more is better you okay. only need two percent biochar to make a difference working two percent biochar over a garden into the soil over your lawn whatever is all you really need to make a difference you don't need tons you don't need tons and tons of it you don't need yards of it you only need a few bags of really good biochar and you will you will increase your water holding capacity your nutrient holding capacity you will increase the um, the, the condo communities for all the bio life in there, all that all the life in there, uh, you yeah. kind of create the living space for them. So biochar is an excellent additive. Just don't go too crazy. Okay. Okay. Do you believe that applying lots of leaf compost on an older mature landscape with mixed borders and beds is the best way to increase overall organic matter? Uh, or I would, say would you invest or apply... Um, or what would you invest or apply to increase the microbiome in landscape soil? So um, if you have healthy living plants, you have a pretty good microbiome already. You just need to keep feeding them and increasing that carbon production. So I like to use leaf mulch okay. or what I do, I do, I do an eco blend, which is decomposed wood chips 
ground up with leaves so it mimics the forest floor. Um, so that's that's a blend that I use. But if you can get your hands on leaf mulch, which is just shredded leaves, it'll go down. It'll be pretty. Um, it breaks down over the course of the season. So it's like a slow release compost. Um, the, the wood mulch itself is doesn't break down very fast uh, and can become repellent to water, etc. I don't hate it, but leaf mulch or a mix uh, is definitely my preference. So that would be that would be the slow way to keep or adding organic matter to your soil. You could add compost, but I don't believe there's probably any need if you are already a gardener, if you're already on here and you already have pretty good gardens and landscape. I don't think you need to take heroic measures and spend all that money. I think just a little bit at a time okay. um, would be fine and half inch to an inch or just using leaf mulch would work. Excellent. OK, this is the last question. In your opinion. What native plant is underrepresented in homeowners' native gardens? <laughs> underrepresented, I would have to say goldenrod. Okay, excellent. I would have to, people think it's a weed. People don't, and at least in my area, they don't like it. They don't care for it. When I tell them I'm going to put it in, they say, what is solidago? I'm like, it's goldenrod. They're like, I don't want that. I'm like, this one is different. It's not, not all of them are run away. Not all of them are going to swallow up your garden. Um, sure. They are so, those and asters are just so important for the migrating birds and the migrating pollinators, Those all those late season bees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just such an important plant. And I really do feel it's underestimated just because people, it's got such a stigma around it. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that, but my, my favorite plant in the garden is zigzag goldenrod. I just love how, how it forms 100%. and it looks beautiful. So appreciate that. I love the Solidago. Well, thank you so much, Trevor. It's been a wonderful afternoon. Um, the chat is filled with um, thumbs up on your presentation. So I'm glad Excellent. you could be here today. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you for inviting me. Take care. Everybody. Yes. And just a reminder for everyone, um, we'll be back on Tuesday, April 16th with Desiree Narango. She'll be cultivating, she'll be presenting cultivating backyard habitat, habitat for pollinators in every season. So I look forward to seeing you then and I will be sharing out links um, so everyone can register for our upcoming events. Have a great day, everyone.